And on the schedule today, we have, uh, we have two lessons. We have first in the morning, we will have Jupiter, and that will be taught by Torvikvel and myself, uh, Johan Helsvik. I, I'm an application expert at the PDC Center for High Performance Computing in Stockholm. We work with uh, yeah, application support in general and, and uh, with a particular niche towards software with a huge for simulations and modeling in uh, computational material science and computational physics. And how about Tour? I introduced myself yesterday, so I'll keep it brief. I'm Tor Wigfeldt. I work at the, the ENCCS Center in Stockholm. Uh, it, it's the Swedish uh, National Competence Center for HPC and, and AI. So we work with uh, the other European centers to uh, boost the competence uh, across borders in Europe in HPC and AI. Okay, thanks. So, um, yeah, so, so the second lesson of today will be the documentation lesson. But right now we start off with the introduction to Jupiter Lab and Jupiter. So you can see here uh, what is on the curriculum. So the overall uh, idea is here that, that we'll, we'll introduce you to the two and you will explore how to use Jupiter Lab on your own computers. And then we will also have an exercise where you are running an instance of a Jupyter Lab notebook in the cloud. So we touched upon this yesterday. It was mentioned at some point, this MyBinder um, service. And that's actually what we'll practice today. Yes. You can, find, you can find the link to the lesson in HackMD or from the workshop page. So I hope you can navigate to this introduction to Jupyter and Jupyter Lab lesson. So we'll start here with, with a brief motivation for Jupyter Notebook. So you can see here an old document. These are notes that were taken by Galileo on the drawing on, on the Jupiter and the Medician stars. And uh, as you can see, it's in Latin as was common at the time. And he has mixed them, I mean, text description and also some uh, graphical representation here where, where he's drawing the, the stars in, in the I mean the positions of, of the of the planets and, and the stars in the notebook. Um, another example which you probably have seen are the, the documents that were drawn by Leonardo da Vinci when he made his sketches and prototypes for various inventions. So in, in a more modern Present context. So, Jupyter notebooks are documents where you mix code, text, equations, and figures, as well as uh, figures and, and, and other graphics. And you do this in a way to, to, to create a computational narrative where you have everything into one document. And uh, this is a very good playground when you work with it on your own. And it's also a very good tool for you to interact with colleagues, as well as with the scientific community at large. The name Jupiter derives from Julia plus Python and R. But today we have Jupiter kernels also for a number of additional languages. So one recent example here is gravitational wave discovery which uh, has reached some quite a lot of attention in the media because there were some, some important discoveries a few years ago. So some of the data has been uh, contained in uh, the Jupyter notebook. It is hosted on uh, GitHub. So I'll click this link. And we come okay. here. So you who are following this, you, you can click the link too, and you can type, uh, click along, but you can also just watch it. It's, a, it's just a case example. It's to show how useful it can be to publish your Jupyter notebooks uh, to enable others to reproduce your steps. Yeah, exactly. So um, what you see here is, is the, the landing page on, on, on GitHub for the repository. I clicked there right when entering the page, I clicked this, um, 
button here, launch binder. And when I do that, I will bring up an instance of the notebook on the, the binder web page. So I have here the notebook hosted on uh, in the cloud. So I can now, uh, just to get started quickly, I go here to the menu to kernel and I choose restart and run all. And then I get a question here. It does a confirmation that they will uh, restart because then all the variables will be cleared. And now the notebook is executing. Scrolling to the top, so what do we have? We have here some uh, description of what it's all is about. And this is written in, in markdown text. Then we have here the, the first code block. So this is written, written in Python code. We declare some variables. And in the second code block here, we import some packages for matplotlib for, for, the, for plotting and uh, also some time series functionality. Here is queried and downloaded the data file. And here you have a plot of the raw time series data. So um, just for example, I will not do it here live, but uh, what one could do here is that uh, one could, for instance, choose another data set to so going up to, to, the, to the cell where we were loading the data and enter another name, and then you load this other data set. And then you can, you, you can execute again and you, you, you get uh, new graphs. And important here, and we will get back to this, is that you can execute the cells one by one or you can execute the whole thing. If you execute them one by one, then the ordering in which you execute them will matter. This is important to be aware of so that you keep variables in sync with each other. So we will now come back to the lesson material here. Um, there's one other example we can highlight. This is about the cell phone usage worldwide. It's a study compiled at Stanford University. Also here, you can find it hosted on, on Binder. So if you're interested, you, you can click it here and explore for yourself. And moreover here, we have here a gallery of interesting notebooks. So just a, a wide range of examples that you can explore. So coming now to what are the use cases that can benefit from Jupyter Notebooks? So it's really good for linear workflows. When you, for instance, you read data, you filter data, do some statistics, and plot the results. It's good for experimenting with new ideas, so rapid prototyping. It's interactive by its very nature on the user interface. It is very beneficial for the sake of teaching because you can mix textual descriptions with the code snippets. And you, you can have it then also in, in, in the learning from other notebooks. I mean, not, not for a course, but, but for making inspiration for creating your own notebooks. Another good use case is that one can use it as supplementary information with published articles. So for instance, if you have an article with uh, four figures in the main article, you might have another four figures in the supplementary, which is in PDF format, then you can, by means of a notebook, you can add on even more figures because the users, I mean, the interested reader can go in there and create the figures in which the person is interested in. So these are the benefits and, and perhaps too, we could talk a little bit about what, what are the, the possible pitfalls with using your notebook. Yeah, you mentioned one, you know, the order in which you execute the cells matters. So you, I mean, it's natural to read code from top to bottom. That's how you're used to reading files. But it's a, for, for like, if, if you're new, new to Jupyter, this might be confusing that you can scroll to the bottom of the notebook, execute a cell there, 
and then scroll to the top and start executing from there. And there will be, so, so running a cell uh, changes the state of the notebook. Um, so, you know, you can get weird chronological errors uh, or bugs uh, if you don't run the cells in a consistent order. So that's something to look out for, but the simple solution to that problem is, you know, whenever you're um, regularly clear the output and run all the cells from top to bottom, uh, just make sure that uh, you don't have these out of order execution bugs in your code. So that's what I thought about initially. One more thing is the version control. This has been um, uh, a problem before. So uh, I will talk about that later, but notebooks are stored in a JSON format. It's, it's a format to store information and everything is encapsulated in this JSON file, including figures and you know, graphical output. And it's not very easily readable uh, by humans. So if you would do a regular Git diff, if you change the notebook, it looks terrible on your screen. But fortunately, and I, you will see that later, there are inbuilt tools now to uh, much easier work with version control and notebooks. So that those are the two points that stand out to me. What what do you think, Johan? Yeah, uh, these are very re relevant points. Uh, I would like to add on also this that a Jupyter notebook is probably not where you would like to put a larger or a really large code base. So if you have something which is ten thousand lines of code, then I mean, you typically then you have it in, in, in traditional source code files, but you can then for the top end application interface make use of, of notebooks. And uh, yeah, there is uh, in fertile chemistry, there's one good example here, the Veloxchem code, which some of you might have heard of, where the computational kernels are, are uh, traditional style. Fortran and, and I think also C code, uh, some of them 30 years old. And it's not, um, not, not so easy to approach, but, but very mature code. And then on top of this have, have been put now uh, a JupyterLab uh, user interface. And here also comes in the aspect that this can be used then both for ongoing research projects and also for teaching theoretical chemistry. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so either you can interact with your existing code, you can import your libraries, your, your functions and test them out and so on, or you start a new project in Jupyter, uh, writing new code functions, whatever. But as, as, the, as a project grows, uh, it's probably best to migrate it at some point to a regular uh, you know, Python files, or R files, or whatever language you're using. Yes. Yes. So we will now uh, introduce um, and walk you through the, the JupyterLab notebook interface. So um, here are the commands, how to start it. I will show them in a minute. But first, just look on, on the big pictures. What are the components? So um, we have uh, the user here, who is one of us that are using the tool. And we interact then with uh, the notebook as hosted in a web browser. And typically then on your local computer, but it, yeah, well, on your local computer, that would be, but, but the notebook server might then be either on your local computer or it might be in the cloud. Uh, or even on a HPC cluster. Yeah, that, that's right. It's good, good you mentioned. Mm. So the notebook file is, so to say, the core document uh, where it's had both the code and data. The computations are performed in a kernel, which is communicating with the notebook server. And uh, this kernel can then be for various languages, such as Python or, or Julia. So uh, how then to start JupyterLab? Um, I now switch over to show a thumbnail window. And I will use these commands here. So uh, first I promote the old instance I had. So now I start, I create a directory. You put Sorry, one quick interruption. You, yes. You're in the code refinery environment now. 
for the oh, code yeah. defender environment. So if anyone is not in the code defender Conda environment, you would do what we learned um, yesterday, right? Conda activate code definery. Yeah, thank you, Tor. Very good, you remind. So I then enter this directory, and, and this is now, I mean, an empty directory. And I start then Jupyterlab. So for most of you, this, by starting Jupyterlab, it will automatically launch the, the notebook in, in a web browser, the one which is your default web browser on your computer. Um, sometimes, and this happens to be the case on my computer, this does not happen. So then I can instead copy the URL and paste it. And the notebook will be launched. So what we can see here, uh, if I toggle in here, we have here to the left, we have a file menu where you can uh, look for files, you can create directories by, by this button here. You can add file with this button. Well, okay, this was a new folder, you can upload files. There is here, and this is contained in the code refinery Conda environment. You, you can have a functionality for interacting with Git as well as with GitHub. And uh, yeah, to, to we'll show this later in, in the lesson. <laughs> So to the right here, we have a so-called launcher. And these buttons here is what we use to uh, start up different, well, a notebook here. The one which is present here is a Python 3 notebook. You could also start up um, a generic terminal or a text file editor or markdown file editor. So I will now start a Python 3 notebook. And now I will, I will um, copy and paste in some, some, some example content. So first and here, here, sorry, I'm always interrupting, but you know, here we see one of the pitfalls of using Jupyter. There's a default name, untitled.ipnv. And it has happened to me and I've heard from others that, you know, these untitled notebooks can accumulate and, you know, because you need an extra step to, actually change the name of it yeah good so, point we, yeah. we uh, let, let, let's uh, let's save it right away so we change here from untitled to first note book and now i did it from the menu but there's also a short command and this is control shift to save or could control s to save or control shift to save as to the standard, okay. come on. Okay, I hide the, the file uh, menu. And uh, looking here on this menu bar here, we see that it's here written code. You can change here to markdown if you want. So this I've done now. Then I take from the lesson material and uh, copy a markdown snippet, paste it here. Uh, you see, uh, I have the cursor here. So I'm now in so-called edit mode in the notebook. If I press escape, I come to command mode. Edit mode, command mode. And I can now execute the, the, the cell. And I do it here by shift enter. And now you see that markdown content has been rendered. One could also use control enter as well as alt enter. And, and you, you find in the lesson that these are slightly different meanings. Um, Shift enter, I guess, is the standard way. It's like it runs the cell and creates a new cell below. Exactly. Yeah. So there are short commands for changing for, from uh, code to markdown. And then I have to press escape first. And then I can change. So M for markdown or Y for code. Now I have it for code, and I take a code snippet, copy it, and paste it, and execute. This was just a print hello 
statement. So uh, let's see here now. Um, a few more shortcuts that can be worth to mention is that you, you could here, if you're in command mode, there are some commands that you can execute just by pressing a single letter. So for instance, if I press uh, D twice, then I delete a cell. This can be convenient to clean up. So, um, and then, you have, and then you have A and B for creating new cells. One, yes. one way. Wait, I mean, you get a new shell when, a cell when you press shift enter, but if you do B now, for example, you get a cell below. If you press A, you get a cell above. I use these, it's, they're quite convenient. Yeah, that, that's good to mention. When they create new cells either above or, or below where you are presently in, in the document. So um, we will now interleave with a little bit of discussion on tools for writing testing and debugging code. So I go back here now to the lesson material. Um, and we will also then bring up what you wrote in the icebreaker question this morning. So, so broadly speaking, one can categorize the tools for, for developing code in, in some categories. So you have terminal editors, for instance, Emacs and Veeam, where you do um, editing. They have support for uh, multiple programming languages with, for instance, syntax highlighting, and they can be run then in the terminal, which is good if you interact on, on supercomputers, for instance. We have code editors, which um, have a more extensive support for programming languages. So offering, for instance, code completion and uh, hints on, on what code to write. And also here you can support multiple programming languages. And then the most perhaps largest or, or most extensive tool are the integrated developing environments in which you can, in addition to editing the code, you could also uh, debug and use functionality for code refactoring. So Tor, perhaps we could bring up some, some uh, yeah, so, so, so things mentioned in HackMD. Yeah, definitely. There was a lot of responses here. And it's interesting to see that people are using a lot of different tools for writing code. Vim, Emacs, Atom, VS Code seems to be quite popular. Eclipse, RStudio, what do we have? MATLAB editor. Jupyter is indicated by some people here. Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, Spider, Sublime, PyCharm. Clion, C Lion. So there's a lot of different tools out there. And of course, we're not recommending you to substitute any of these tools for Jupyter. We're just introducing Jupyter as a tool for a certain use case, certain use cases. And we want to highlight um, this uh, idea of using them to share code, share data, share research, share scientific you know, findings in a Jupyter notebook, putting them online and so on. So that's for the tools. Um, yeah, you have it on screen, excellent. Yeah. Yeah, we can also highlight, you have different tools mentioned there for how to test your code. And uh, yeah, this disconnects then a bit here to the editors and so, but perhaps we can, uh, I think we'll have the opportunity to come back to, to tools for testing in, in the lesson we have tomorrow on software testing. Yeah. Yeah, tomorrow we'll learn about testing. Uh, so people, some people clearly are testing their code already, um, but not everyone probably. And debugging, we talked about this before, walking, sleeping, and print statements. It's, it's an excellent way to debug code. <laughs> it, uh, you often, if you have a bug, which you cannot really wrap your head around, it can be actually be useful just to stand up and walk around or go to sleep. So we um, will now um, let you get going with creating your first computational notebook. Um, so we just like to introduce what, what the exercise is about. So in uh, notebooks, you have the chance to create a computational narrative. I mean, that, that's one of the real strengths of, of, the, of the tool. 
So the narrative here for this exercise is that you, well, you imagine that you're on a desert island and you would like to compute Pi. And you have a computer with you with Python installed, but you do not have any mathematical libraries. And you also do not have any Wikipedia where you could just simply look up, look, look up what Pi is. But what you do have is your knowledge that Pi is related to the circumference and the radius of a circle. And from this insight, you can come up with the idea that you could probably calculate pi by comparing the area of, uh, of a circle with the area of a square in which the, the circle is inscribed. So we generate random points and we, and we throw them on, on our canvas. And then we count how many of the darts or the random numbers are within the circle and how many are outside the circle, but within the square. So um, the idea is then when you get starting with a notebook and, and I think you can hear perhaps too, you could, uh, you could uh, copy this to the, to the HackMD or I think it's already in the HackMD, the, the, this direct link. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's in the top of the HackMD. Yeah, we, we can add it in the middle at the end of HackMD too. So um, the idea is here that in the notebook, creating the narrative, you, you could then first add on what is the task about. You can then have in markdown format the description of the relevant mathematics. So here so, so some uh, geometric uh, relations for the the square area and the, and the circle area and so forth. Uh, and then you can then mix in some graphics and you can then get going with the actual code for doing the, the calculation. So um, you have instructions here to do it in steps and uh, we will now uh, let you work on this for some 20 minutes. And uh, some of you will do this in exercise groups and uh, some of you will do it on your own. And, and as usual, we will interact on HackMD. So, so please raise any questions you have there also in the HackMD. Yeah, and if, if you finish this quickly, if you're already an experienced Jupyter user, um, there is an optional exercise below if you would like to explore using different programming languages in Jupyter. Yes, thank you. So what do we have, a 20 minute exercise? If we have 20 minutes, yes. So that would be to 9.58 or 58, no, oh, sorry, 48, 48 after the full hour. Yeah. Good. Good. Exercise time. Exercise time. All right, Johan, we are live. Yes, so um, we hope many but of you... Exercise is not over, right? So... Uh, no, that, 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 that's exactly. We, we have another nine minutes to work on the exercise. And um, probably many of you are busy working on the exercise and, and we do not want to distract you. So please keep working up until... 49. I but, mute us on Twitch, right? Yes, you can mute us on Twitch. That said, we, we thought that uh, we could also demo over Twitch the, the walking through the, this notebook. If some of you would like to see that. So uh, I will. launch a new notebook.
So I, I now change the name of the notebook to uh, dot uh, calculation of pi. And I have here a first heading to describe what this is about. And this will be in markdown format. So I change here from code to markdown. Execute, I get then in, in bold text, this title. Here comes another snippet with markdown text. And here's where I describe the the relevant formulas. Oops, sorry. Ah, this is interesting because here you can see that I had this cell here was was specified as a code cell, but what I type what I pasted here was markdown text, and then I tried to execute it, and you got an error here for invalid syntax, which is completely reasonable. So now I change to have this in markdown format. And I execute a new. And now we get the, the relevant formulas up here. So we'll now add an image. And still here, this is markdown. Yeah, and here you can see so this is the red circle, which is here going into a square. So the red points here are within the circumference of the circle and the blue points here are outside the circle, but within the square. So now we will start with the Python code. So at first we need to import some modules. And now, okay, this is, a code cell and we have code here. What we import is a random number library and we'll import also the matplotlib library. We execute and nothing happens because this was import commands and they executed without error message. Now comes the computational kernel where we are throwing the darts. Oops. Okay, here we got an error. So why could this have happened? Ah, uh, now I see. Uh, it's because I forgot to copy in one code snippet, namely the initialize the number of points. So I put it in in the in my buffer, and then I want to uh, add a cell bow here. Let's see. If I, is it the A command too? To yes. Create a cell, yeah. Yeah, it was the A command. And now I'm initializing the number of throws. Now comes the throwing of darts, which then executed cleanly. Next step is to plot the results with matplotlib. We take them here, execute. Now you can see all the dots. And the number of dots here is as specified up here. So we have a thousand points. Then in the last step, we do the calculation of the estimate of pi. And it comes out as 3.12. So it's uh, correct to the first two leading digits, but uh, the third digit is, is off. Um, we could then see what happens if we change this number to 10,000, and then we recalculate the estimate here. 
And now you can see here that the result is 0 0.3112. So why is that? Yeah, it's because I happen to execute these code statements in this order. So I skipped over the recalculation of the throwing of the, the darts. So in order then to get a correct result, you go to the menu and take restart kernel and run all cells. In doing so, I will then get the result calculated with 10,000 darts thrown instead of 1,000. Uh, but nevertheless, okay, actually the, the estimate here came out as 3.16, so it's not that much better actually. But this is random numbers, so there's always a standard deviation here on how far you deviate from the precise result. So is there anything we could add here, Thor? Um, sorry, I was uh, busy thinking about something else for a second. If I would like to add, no. Did you have a particular question? No, not not not. No, not nothing specific. No. Okay, welcome back from the exercise. Johan, do you want to summarize what what we just did? Yes. So uh, we have now. We were walking it through here over Twitch also, so some of you might have seen that. And uh, what we explored was to calculate pi first with uh, 1,000 thrown darts. And then we explored what happened if we changed to have 10,000 darts thrown and then executing the cells out of order. And then we got an estimate of pi, which was 10 times too small. But then restarting the kernel and executing all cells from the top, I mean, the number came out as expected. Yeah, that's, so, that's what you were demonstrating, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, so that, exactly. Yeah. But um, most people probably just went through these eight steps and, and got a nice uh, sort of computational narrative in a notebook. Yeah, and, and then uh, perhaps some of you were also finding time to explore how to. Uh, import and activate kernels for JupyterLab for, for R or for Julia. And if not, you, you can find the links here so you can explore that at a later point if you're interested. So just, just to wrap up this first exercise. So uh, you have not, now got acquainted with, with a rather uh, quick, but, but nevertheless, so to say, a real example of a computation and a whole computation narrative that you can do within a Jupyter notebook. And um, to give an example of a, so to say, real life example um, of, of sharing of the power of um, having this narrative is um, was one research project where I was involved a few months ago. We, are, um, we were having some data sets that had been post-processed up to a point. We had some figures which were, they were correct, but perhaps not in a consistent style and not to the quality that you can put in a manuscript for submission to a journal. And um, when time goes, it, it's quite often that perhaps some person is perhaps uh, leaving, is not available because due to other duties or, or have moved on to, to another job. So it then happened that I had to take over uh, the whole data set and the post-processing. And this was then done all of it by means of a Jupyter notebook. And um, it was, was quick for me to get started with working with this data. So I could directly then get to the core of looking at the data set and then to uh, generate the relevant new figures. So I, I think probably a few of you have also similar experiences on, on, on this uh, strength of the notebook at, as a tool for the workflow. Okay, so uh, Tu, do you have anything to add uh, here before we move on to the next episode? 
No, I, I don't think so. I just hope that anyone new to Jupiter found it interesting, found it inspiring uh, for certain use cases, possibly. Uh, so the bottom line here is that it can be good to collect documentation, figures, uh, you know, results, data, and code in one document. Great. So then the next episode will be on version control. And, and then I think you can take over the screen sharing. I'll take over screen and then we have a, a break after a short session now. Let me take over the screen. Does it look fine? It looks fine. So I have the same notebook as we were all working on. You see, I've been running the cells. Um, I have the graphical output here. I have a rather poor estimate of pi, but that doesn't matter. I have the computational notebook. And I will now go to the lesson page again. Where are we? Yes, here's the episode. I will go to the next episode. Click the next button. It takes us to notebooks and version control. Uh, this is the demo. So you can follow. If you want, you can type along. Um, but uh, to avoid multitasking too much, maybe you can just follow and then you, you repeat the steps later. So we mentioned already in the beginning that JSON, this JSON file format, which uh, notebooks are stored in, are not great for version control, for Git, for things like Git diff, Git merge, seeing merge conflicts, stuff like that. So I will show you a, a few tools that are very useful to, um, to, to circumvent this problem. Uh, so early on, uh, when Jupyter was developed and, and announced to the world, this didn't exist. So people had, I mean, version control of notebooks was not good, was very annoying and, and difficult to work with. But now, really, it's pretty seamless. So we have highlighted here NB time. It's a command line utility. I can show it to you later. JupyterLab Git is it's an extension in JupyterLab, which uh, makes it possible to show very nice sort of uh, clear uh, graphical uh, versions of, of a Git diff, basically. And JupyterLab GitHub, I will not directly show it. It's, um, it's an extension to ac for accessing uh, GitHub repositories. If you install it, you can navigate to a GitHub repository inside JupyterLab and load a notebook into your JupyterLab session. Uh, we have all of these within the code refinery on the environment. Yeah. So well, I have already done these steps. Uh, I have my notebook here in a new folder. So I would like to maybe this wasn't maybe you didn't see this clearly from the earlier demonstration by you on that you if you click the uh, the launcher here. You can open up a terminal. If you go to other, you can get that uh, open up a terminal. I've done that. So I have my terminal right here. What I could even do if I wanted to do is to move it around. I can put it here if I want a more sort of modular split up environment. And I, I've added my notebook here. It's in a folder called Jupyter. It's called first notebook. Before, so I will now in, initialize a Git repository and I will uh, show you how, how to work with Git inside JupyterLab. But before I do that, I'll just click this Git button. Okay, it hasn't refreshed. <laughs> well, it actually shouldn't be showing anything here before I initialize the Git repository. It's because I had a Git repository there before. So there's some, it remembers what was there before. So you shouldn't, it probably this should be empty for you if you're typing along. Anyway, I will initialize my Git repository here. Uh, it asked me if I want to rename my branch to main, but uh, let's not do that right now. I typed Git in it. Now I will do a Git status. It has um, a first notebook, and this is actually a file I created before. So let's have a look at my Git ignore file. We talked about Git ignore on day one last week. So what I have added here to this file is the 
dot ipy and b underscore checkpoints directory because this is this is a directory where Jupyter puts uh, backups checkpoint uh, backups of your notebooks as you're working. This is not something you typically want to version control, so we add it to uh, the git ignore file. Uh, but both of these files are untracked. Uh, so let's add them both. Git add, git ignore. And a git add first notebook. I will do a git status. These two new files. Uh, there are no commits, but I have staged them. So let's make an initial commit. Git commit minus M first commit. Okay. Git status, check our status, nothing to commit, nothing there. Git log. That, that's my first commit. Okay. Uh, now let me I will let me just maybe move this up here again so that it doesn't uh, so I can get a fuller picture of my of my notebook here. I showed you this uh, side menu on the left. Now there are no changed files. If I modify my notebook, I can actually use this uh, left side uh, uh, version control button here to uh, stage files to and to commit files if I wanted to. But the focus here is on git diff and so on. So I want to show you this um, git button. If I here at the top menu, if I press this button, it will show me uh, on the left and right side how my notebook has changed. Git diff gives no output now, so that's why it doesn't show anything here. I will do this in a minute again after I modify my notebook. But I just I wanted to show you one more thing. So if I go to the um, file browser, I have my notebook here. I wanted to demonstrate how the uh, JSON file format looks. If I right click, I can right click on the file. I could go to open with and I'll open with editor. And then I will collapse this uh, menu again. You see, this is the underlying, this is the file, basically, the, the contents of the file. The uh, angular brackets denote cells. So here's a code cell. Uh, it has lots of metadata. Every, every cell has some metadata. And then when there's an image, like the one we created here with, uh, with the darts, the full image in PNG is represented as this long, extremely unreadable string. Uh, which, yeah, it's, I mean, it doesn't make sense to look at, at it this way. And that's why if we were to change my notebook, if I go here and I change a color, I can take uh, green instead of red. I execute it. And I will update my plot as well. I execute this cell too. Okay, I updated my graph. I will save the notebook by Control S or Command S on Mac. This will now change the JSON, right? This will change the JSON, but how will it change? I go back to my terminal. We are we have learned <clears throat> last week to use git diff. Git diff is perfect for seeing what we have changed and committing the right thing and so on, making sense of your git repository. So, but if I do it here, it diff. Okay, so far so good. Uh, something was changed here. That's okay, but hold on. Here, we the git diff, of course, contains um, the removal of one figure and the addition of another figure. So the git diff is, is completely flooded by this long random string here, representing the PNG image. So that's not desirable. We want to avoid that. So that's why this Git extension is very useful. This Git, Git button I showed you on top. If I press this button now, OK, I have a side-by-side -side view. I changed uh, a code line, uh, something, the output changed. OK, so I see the figure. 
it used to look like this now it looks like this yeah so this is a much more human yeah. friendly diff i mean it's just dramatically different i mean now actually yes. working control is useful it was it's yes. not useful if you get the, the random text in your terminal so that's one way of doing it it's probably the, the yeah the most natural way if you're inside Jupyter Lab anyway to use this inbuilt uh, tools here. But there was this NB Dime tool. Let me just share my screen. So it's, could I just interleave? So there was a question yeah. here on the hack MD when we're going to have a break. And right yeah, the, yeah the, it will happen right after this episode. Yeah. So in, in a, a few minutes. minutes. That's that's the answer in a few minutes. So I just wanted, the, as a final demo, show NB. NB Dime is the name of the tool. NB diff is the git diff command. If I do git diff here, NB diff, sorry. Uh, it doesn't show me this huge uh, text string representing the PNGs. So it only shows me that one uh, image file has been changed. There's a new a PNG and there's the, an old PNG was taken away. So that's also much more clearly uh, readable. If, you, if you're working with Jupyter Notebooks and you still want to use a terminal, you can use obviously the git diff. Uh, sorry, I keep saying the wrong thing. So NB diff, you can use this NB diff tool. But as a final, uh, final feature, which I would like to show you is that you can configure git to use NB Dime by default. So you don't need to even remember the NB diff command. You can just configure git using this NB Dime config git minus minus enable. And then if you want to do it for all your repositories, you add the minus minus global. And if you do this, if I do this now, go back to my not or to my terminal here. I use NB Dime to configure my git. Now, a git, regular git diff, which earlier gave me this very unreadable output, now it should actually show me the nicer NB diff type of output. Yeah. Yeah, th this looks really good. Yeah. So yeah, thank God there are these tools out there now. So you should definitely install them if you plan on using uh, Jupyter in your work. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So well, prep, prep fun computing comment here on, on, on diffs for, for Jupyter Notebooks. So, so it goes as usual for uh, for a document like this, as compared also to with, with other code that uh, it's good practice if you try to keep separate what is the code that you're executing and then what is the data. Because if you are reusing the, the notebook for, uh, for, for for many data sets or, or, or many occasions, th then uh, it's nice if you can have sort of the version history of the notebook separate from the version history of uh, the data. Hmm. Okay, so I think it's now it's high time to have a break and it's seven past the full hour and we will have a 10 minute break. So that will be up until 17 past the full hour. So welcome back at 17 past. See you then. Hey, welcome back uh, from the break. Um, so I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on demo type along. So I realized that there's a lot of things to keep in mind at the same time. So I just wanted to wrap up this part. So I was demoing these two tools, NBDime and JupyterLab Git. NBDime was the command line uh, tool. JupyterLab Git was an extension to JupyterLab that gives us extra features inside JupyterLab, including this, if I go back to my notebook here, including this Git button and this, uh, this way to actually stage and commit files directly from JupyterLab, JupyterLab on the left side panel here. 
So I know it went a bit quick with my git, uh, my git commands. So if you got lost and you would like to see exactly what I did, I copy pasted the history, the command history into HackMD just below question 59. But um, the, yeah, so hopefully you can also go back to um, this episode here and uh, make it work on your own uh, machine. Okay, that was, uh, that was it about Git. So we have one more interesting thing to go through now. So I will click the next uh, button here and we get to sharing notebooks. This is maybe the, the highlight of the lesson. So sharing notebooks, how can we share notebooks with colleagues and the community and the whole world? Uh, that's what we've been argumenting for to an extent, to make our science open, to make our analysis transparent, to make our research reproducible by others. And this is really encapsulated here in this exercise. So sharing dynamic notebooks on Binder. I would just like to tell you first that Binder is a technology. It's a way to create computational environments uh, that can be set up in the cloud. And uh, my binder, it's this URL, mybinder.org. It's a free service that uses Binder. So it's, uh, it's basically free uh, hardware in the, in the cloud which is running Binder and you can use it for your notebooks. If you have a notebook or many notebooks on GitHub or other uh, uh, repository hosting services online, you can make them available for others to interactively explore using my Binder. And that's exactly what you will do here. So I'm not gonna do the exercise. I'm not gonna pre, yeah. I'm not gonna spoil it for you. I will just tell you roughly what to do. So you should be somewhere, uh, you should have a notebook um, if you followed along earlier. If you don't already have a notebook and you would still like to do this, I would recommend that you download this notebook here. You can see it in the so, next slides. Yeah. Thor, there is another comment in HackMD that Binder is giving 503 again. Oh, uh, it's back to 503. Page. So we noticed this 20 minutes ago and panicked a little bit because this happens sometimes. Uh, I mean, it's not, they, they're not like uh, Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud. They don't have millions of machines there. And sometimes they have outages or they have uh, uh, maintenance windows or something like that. They, that can happen. And we saw it 20 minutes ago, but then it came back online. So this is disappointing. Where did I have my documentation? I have it here. This is actually, sorry for all the window jumping, but yeah. So I see that one of the servers is failing right now. The question is what to do. So there are other deployments of uh, this binder. Uh, maybe I will follow HackMD to see if people have an opinion on what I should do. So there, there are two, yeah, we could use Cola, but um, things are not really prepared for it. And people, we don't want to require anyone to use their uh, Google accounts if they, if they even have a Google account. So I could do this as a type along using a different, my bind, uh, different binder deployment. Yeah, so you had one which is hosted by a university, wasn't it? Yeah, so Richard actually told me about this. It's brilliant. Uh, where am I? Here. So Alto University in, in Finland uh, hosts its own Binder instance. And it looks exactly, the web page is now exactly the same as what we had on mybinder.org, what mybinder.org is down. So at, all of us cannot go to this URL. Yeah, uh, it will maybe. probably kill the server with Please too much load. Don't. It's not probably um, made for hundreds of people. So what I think I'll do then is to just demo this. 
and then you can reproduce the steps yourself later on mybinder.org whenever it comes back online. So I, I must say honestly that I haven't really seen such a consistent outage before. I've seen this happen minutes at a time, but now it's really been uh, problematic for over 20 minutes. Um, anyway, it's a free resource, so I guess it can happen. So, so Richard, is, is the, the Alto service, is it available for, for everyone? Or does no. it... Please no. don't, please other people don't use it. This is just a demo. Yeah, this is just a demo. Yeah, thank you. Ignore the URL. I will do this exercise and I will try to uh, tell you what's happening. So what's the first step is to create a new GitHub repository. I will go to my GitHub. And um, normally I have the fuller screen. How do I now create when it's so? Find repositories. Normally I have it on my full screen, but now the buttons for creating the repository aren't here. I'll just size up my window for a second, just so I find my plus create repository button. I will change my screen in a second. Okay. Let me do it like this again. Okay, so I create a new repository. Uh, let's call it first notebook. It was I... not your first notebook. No, <laughs> sorry, second <laughs> notebook then. Well. I'll call it my first notebook and I will create a public repository. I will not add a readme file because I want the project to start. I want the repository online to be empty because I have a local repository with my notebook. So I don't want any initial commits on github.com. Uh, public, okay, create repository. Here it's telling me what to do. Let me just move this window a little bit here and I go back to Jupyter Lab. And I will go back to my terminal. And I will clear my screen. Again, this is just a demo. So you should only be watching, seeing how this works, see, seeing the basic concept here. And then you can try it yourself uh, whenever mybinder.org comes back up online. So where was I in my, where's my, what's the status, get status. I had modified something, let me just, um, uh, let's say I, well, let's do an MD diff. What did I do? Yeah, I updated the figure. So let me just make a commit. Git add my first notebook. I staged the file, git add, name of the file and then i do a git commit with a message update uh, figure colors just so that we have a clean git status sorry i used a shortcut i shouldn't have done that git status is the full command Okay, so I wanted to have uh, a repository locally and then push it to the new repository online, push it to the remote. For that to happen, I first should uh, copy paste this here. So push an existing repository from the command line. That's precisely what I want. I copied it, pushing this button here, go back and I'll just paste it here. So you will now upload the full uh, calculation of, of pi example then? I pushed the whole thing. I, yeah, my local repository, which had, I think, two commits. I first added the remote. This is what we did yesterday. Uh, sorry, this is what we did uh, last week. I needed to rename my local branch because main is now the new default name. And then I pushed it. 
with the minus U to connect the uh, remote branch on origin to my local branch main. Okay, so then I go back here. I can click code, for example. When, when the screen is a little bit tight like this, you know, I made it into portrait size, I will have to push this view code to actually see it. Okay, what's the next step of the exercise? Um, yeah, to, to, Yeah, to, to, to bring it up on a binder hosting service. And we will yeah, then use the, the Finnish service at Alto. Yeah. So I will use another deployment of Binder, basically. And, but only I should do it because it's not made for 100 people. It's made for maybe a local uh, course at the university. So what have we done? I've done steps one and two. I will now create a requirements file. And this we learned about yesterday in the reproducibility lesson. It's very important that we do this. And why? Why think about it for 10 seconds? Why do we need to uh, supply a requirements.txt file? So an environment.yml file would also work. Yeah, so I, I could fill in with an answer. So the reason is here that we are making use of matplotlib for plotting the throwing of the darts. So unless we have a matplotlib Python package available, we cannot import it when we are executing the notebook. Yeah, so this we need, we needed this of course locally and we had it locally. That's why we could run the notebook. We have matplotlib installed, but bind the, the cloud instance that we will get on this binder service will not have a pre-installation of Python. Everything will be installed into a new container actually in the cloud. And uh, we need to give the requirements so that our instance on Binder has the dependencies. Yeah, so, so the, the right dependencies get installed. So our notebook can actually run in the cloud. So that's very important. So I'll go back to Jupyter Lab. And let me open, I'll do everything from within JupyterLab. There's no need to go to a external terminal. I will open up the file browser and this launcher plus. Again, I'm just demoing. It's just a demo. So what did I want? I want a text file. Ah, oh, so you're creating the requirements.txt within the JupyterLab interface yeah i mean you can work with us yeah so you it, the, the most common use case obviously i mean it's for notebooks but sometimes you need to work with other files you can and you can for that you can use this text editor and you can use a terminal like i've been doing for any shell commands you might want to use yeah that's very powerful to have it all in, in one joint user interface definitely and it's very popular for data science for inter interactive analysis so it's, it's, it can be good to have one tool for everything. So I will save the file just like with note, notebooks, they're called untitled. So let me just rename it to requirements.txt. And let's go back to terminal. I will just clear the screen, Hit status. Ah, this one is uh, stayed around. It's a little bit annoying, but let me just state the requirements file and commit it with git commit minus m add requirements. You, this hopefully feels familiar. We state the files, we commit the files, and finally I push. I only need Git push. I don't need origin main anymore because the two branches are connected. Uh, okay. So the commit should be here now. View code, it's here. What's the next step of the exercise? Now, finally, I go to Binder. I will go to this uh, special 
university binder, which only I should be doing at the moment. And what do I do there? I visit the website. There will be, so let me just do it here. Build and launch a repository. So we give it the URL of the repository. And you can choose whether it's a GitHub or Git, uh, GitLab, or you can even put Zenodo. If you have notebooks on Zenodo or Figshare, you can provide the, those URLs here too. In my case, I will only, uh, I will take this URL. That's my repository on GitHub. And I will put it here. Yeah, and as it turns out, this you need to do only once, I think, because then you will be able to display this text snippet, which you can put into the readme of the Git repository, which exactly. will then provide you with a launch binder button. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is a one-time initial setup. After you do this, you will have this nice button on your, on your repository, which anyone can click and interactively in, uh, interact with your, your, your notebook. We don't need to give anything here or here. All we want is to copy the URL below to share your binder with others. Actually, that's one way to do it. I want to expand the last section. That's what I want to do. And I want to copy paste uh, this markdown text. You can, there's also a version in, in restructured text, RST. We will actually learn about RST later today, but I will do it like so. Take the markdown and I will go to GitHub. And let me just add the readme already uh, from the GitHub interface. I will let me just push, put the button here at the very top. So you see, this is markdown syntax. If you're familiar with markdown and I will make a commit. Add my binder button. That's my commit message. And I will commit directly to the main branch. Nice, I have the launch binder button here. Anyone who can find my notebook can now find my repository, can now push this button and this will fire up in the cloud my, my, uh, my notebook. This might take a couple of minutes. And while it launches, I just will summarize uh, what we have done so far. So when we're done, we should be enjoying ourselves for being fully reproducible. This is very cool. You can, you can become completely reproducible, putting everything, well, you don't need to put everything, but uh, it, it's pretty cool to be able to share your notebooks with the whole world like this. There are some optional exercises. You can try them at home if you want after the workshop. I just want to summarize that there are other ways to share notebooks. So many tools uh, understand uh, the notebook format. We will learn about read the docs very soon in the documentation lesson and you can, it can render Jupyter notebooks. What's more here, there are many different, you can convert uh, Jupyter notebooks to other formats. You can uh, con convert it directly to Python. You can even create HTML to put on a web page or LaTeX or PDF or slideshows. And there are these other um, services online like Google Colab, CoCalc, Microsoft Azure Notebooks that offer in some cases some free online uh, notebook uh, services. So you can run notebooks in the cloud or, and or some paid services too. Yeah, so speaking of, of free services, so uh, yeah. was one very relevant comment on HackMD, namely yeah. that given here that we experienced this uh, downtime on my binders. So how attractive is it then with such a service if you can have downtime? And um, mm. yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, however, as it is now with what we currently have been setting up with, with the Jupyter Notebook, mm. it is so that actually we did it all 
and run it locally on a computer. You could perhaps have uh, launched also on a supercomputer. Um, to launch it on, on my binder is just an extra opportunity. So whatever work we did with, with the notebook was not in vain. It's just that right now my binder happens to be not available. Mm. So um, it's always good then to have a fallback option to, to be able to launch it on another service. And, and as my binder is stating on the web page, this is an experimental service for, I mean, made available free of charge. So it's not intended for operating mission critical 24 seven services. Mm. Yeah, but I, I actually hope that my binder will be um, built, built out, that it will be extended with time. Um, I mean, people donate uh, hardware to it and donate services. So, but it's all in the spirit of open science, openness, reproducibility. So I really hope there is, uh, and there is good hope that uh, this will improve with time, but it's already good. I mean, I am teaching in workshops where we rely on my binder. We actually have people, 40 people in a classroom or online workshops uh, run stuff on my binder. And so far it's been going fine. Um, yeah. But so let's see what this uh, outage today is about. But now I'm online. So I, th this is on my binder. My notebook is now available to be executed in the cloud. I could uh, open the notebook here. This is not running on my machine. It's running somewhere in the cloud. And you see that matplotlib is installed. That's because we provided the requirements file. So there's no problem to import this Python package. And yeah. So I can reproduce the results. I can, yeah, that's the idea. So I hope you will, after the workshop, be able to play around with this yourself. And if you already have notebooks with your research, with stuff, stuff you would like to share, put it on GitHub and make it available to others. Can Anything I comment? To add? Yeah. Can I comment some on the binder Definitely. reproducibility issue? Yeah. So yeah, there were lots of, some comments like, yeah, should we be using Binder? And like Thor said, it's quite often available. But also I think a main point here is that what we did to make it work with Binder is stuff that we should be doing anyway. Like nothing here mm. that none of the setup we did was special to Binder. We made a requirements.txt file, which any repository should have already. If Binder is using R, it uses the our environment file or whatever it is. So basically, um, the overhead of like, yeah. So binder is designed to not be something special that you can either use it or not use it. And also then the tools of binder are modular. So the main tool there is something called repo to Docker, which you could even run locally. So let's say someday in the future, Binder doesn't work. So first off, you can clone the repository and set it up yourself because all the things are already in there. If you want to go another step, you can have the tool repo to Docker and then turn it into your own container image, which you would run locally and so on. Mm. So I would imagine someday there's not just the one Binder, but say the your own university might have its own binder, which can run things and so on. And even if it doesn't, well, yeah, it's still reproducible. Well, ask, ask your IT departments to install it. <laughs> yeah. Right. One of my goals is that one of my ideas was that we could use this Alto binder and contribute it to the My Binder Federation, the spare hmm. computer power. But I hadn't gotten that far yet. But anyway, yes. Yeah. Any other input from you guys, Johan, Richard? I think we have. I think we have covered yeah. covered it all. So just looking here on the HackMD. Um, I think yeah. I mean, as usual, we we, we will uh, review the HackMD and, and answer questions also a little bit offline. And uh, yeah, on my side, uh, nothing more to say for now. And. Uh, Perhaps now looking at the clock, it's 10.43. So Richard, what do you say? Should we have a little bit, a few minutes of break before the next lesson? Yeah. Um, 
But I want to add one thing. Yeah. yeah. So in the very last uh, episode, I clicked the arrow button to, oops, to get here. There's a short summary. I don't want to go through it. There's just some links and, and so on. Uh, a, a recommendation on avoiding repetitive code. But while we are switching to the next set of instructors and um, all the technical uh, stuff and maybe a short leg stretch and break, if anyone, it's an optional question. You don't have to answer it, but I copy pasted it already to HackMD. It would be interesting to get your input. If you are already using Jupyter, what tasks do you use it for? Um, if you're new to Jupyter, do you see any possible use cases? So if you if you want to uh, answer these questions in HackMD, just for to share ideas between us, all of us. And that's it from me. So thank you for this morning. Okay, so I guess we will have a break now where, um, yeah, we are, yeah, so let's have a 10 minute break because five minutes is not enough. So that's until 55. And yes, we will see you when we're back. Bye. Bye. Bye.